concept. Uh, let me move on to the uh, second part of my lecture, which is about uh, uh, citizenship law. And uh, in doing uh, in 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 this, but in this section, I would be focusing on um, the citizenship law in India. Uh, and particularly, I would be, since all of us are here, uh, uh, social scientists and uh, uh, doing a, a, a so social scientists and also, of course, you know, people belonging to other disciplines who are also uh, addressing questions of how you define categories, what kind of methodologies you, know, you evolve or, or design to study how uh, concepts uh, uh, operationalize and uh, how 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 you see concepts you know in in the field and also how how do concepts present yourself themselves in the field so let me in this uh, particular uh, in section of my lecture also uh, present to you uh, a methodological conundrum so so this this would be you know uh, a discussion this 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 section of the lecture would be a discussion around the citizenship law but it would be also uh, it would also uh, push us towards uh, thinking of uh, you know how what would be an appropriate way of understanding citizenship in the contemporary context so so that would be the problem that we would be addressing you know. uh, and 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 since we are talking about you know citizenship uh, through the uh, the 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 ways in which it has uh, evolved in India uh, and the debates which have accumulated, you know, around citizenship in uh, uh, in India uh, through the law of citizenship, I would you know first of all uh, very briefly um, uh, lay down before you how I use this category of law. Uh, and I use this category of law uh, for the discussion in this section in two ways. No, one is to look at uh, law itself as something that has life. So there is, uh, and, and, and therefore the methodology that you know, I would be, uh, uh, I would be uh, presenting before you uh, is to, uh, to to submit law to an anthropological scrutiny so that you know, law itself becomes you know, a subject of inquiry so so how how has law uh, you know, uh, developed over a period of time you know, what are the signposts through which law has evolved over a period of time and uh, you no know, what do these signposts tell us you know? so how do we connect these different signposts in the life of a law. So which would again mean that citizenship is not static. And uh, you know, even if we were to look at citizenship in terms of uh, you know, status, you know, how is it that law tells us what kind of status uh, this is? So, so the first, the first the, the one way in which I would be using uh, citizenship uh, the law of citizenship is to you know, subject it to an anthropological inquiry, which would mean that I would consider the law itself as uh, the citizenship law itself as a live subject. Uh, the second way in which I would uh, uh, look at the law of citizenship is to, uh, to, to, to look at the anthropological functions that law performs. So, Whereas in the first uh, 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 lens of looking at the law, I was uh, making law itself a subject of anthropological inquiry. In the second lens, I'm going to use law as performing an anthropological function. And when I say it's performing an anthropological function, I'm suggesting that uh, law produces uh, subjects of particular kind, and 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 while articulating uh, these uh, different categories of uh, you no know, subjects, or uh, you know within the framework of citizenship, you know who is a citizen and who is not, and uh, and then 
uh, articulates categories such as uh, illegal migrants or uh, you know and, or identifies different dates along which you know one could uh, 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 you know uh, which would become the bookends or, or, or bracket the chronology chronological boundaries of citizenship what is it that the law is doing so so uh, in that sense then we can see uh, the law of citizenship as performing an anthropological function uh, so so let me come to the uh, uh, another uh, methodological problem that uh, one can perhaps uh, you know, uh, flag uh, when one looks at the life of the citizenship law in the country. And, and this has to do with uh, the idea that, uh, you know, that uh, citizenship, you know, going back to the earlier idea of citizenship as a momentum concept, which which means that citizenship is both a promise and uh, it's 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 about you no know, uh, it's it's inclusive you no know, it brings in more and more people in its fold you no know, and and while doing so it it also assumes different forms so there is a way in which uh, citizenship is seen as encompassing you no know? so so there are uh, ways in which people can become citizens and and think of themselves as belonging to the political community. However, uh, there's this other understanding that uh, uh, I also flagged in the earlier part of the lecture, where citizenship is about closures. No? Citizenship is about determining who belongs and who does not belong. So they are then at the, there are two uh, ends of the spectrum where citizenship is uh, you know, about closures, you know, determining uh, the, 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 the parameters of exclusion and inclusion. And the other, at the other end of the spectrum is the idea that citizenship is constantly unfolding in a way that it can be seen as assuming a, 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 a force or a momentum where uh, no people are, would not be actually excluded, but more and more people would potentially be part of this political community. And when you look at the citizenship law in, in India, one can see that uh, uh, there are some definitive signposts. No? So, so if you look at the, the Bear Act of Citizenship, for example, no? then the, the Bear Act of Citizenship that you would buy now uh, would have uh, amendments right up to 2019, no? that the latest amendment in the Citizenship Act but there were earlier amendments as well. And, and the Citizenship Act itself came into existence in 1955. But uh, the, there were uh, constitutional frameworks of citizenship that came into force in November 1949. So, so we can easily identify you no know, different signposts in the life of the citizenship law. So there's one signpost that can be traced to the Constitution of India, so, and which became effective in 1949, 26 November 1949. But uh, before that, however, there is there are antecedent moments to this particular historical signpost, where you know, the, the, the debates around citizenship in the Constituent Assembly would constitute another temporal site you know, around which uh, you know, uh, the principles of citizenship were being discussed and determined. What are the legal forms that citizenship would take? You know, and uh, what should the law of citizen, uh, citizenship look like? Uh, or the, uh, the, the, the question uh, whether the Constituent Assembly was framing a law of citizenship, which was not what the Constituent Assembly was supposed to do, or articulating the principles around which the law of citizenship would be framed by a future parliament. So those were some of the debates that were taking place in the Constituent Assembly. So the Constituent Assembly debates, the constitutional frameworks that eventually came into force in 1949, November 1949, then a hiatus, and 
1955, the citizenship law comes into existence. And then in 1985-86, there is another moment of change or transition in the citizenship law, which addressed itself to the specific context of Assam. And then again, 2003 was another signpost, which I consider a hinge point in the life of the citizenship law. And then further on, there's another signpost of the 2016 and 2019 moment in the citizenship life, a law, life of the citizenship law, where other momentous changes are brought into the Citizenship Act. Now, if one was to look at these different signposts and see how they tie up together, there would perhaps be no two ways of looking at it. And no earlier, before the 2016 and 2019 amendments were being discussed and you know, they came into the 2019 amendment came into force, it was perhaps easy to, or there was perhaps a, a way in which two kinds of ways of looking at citizenship presented themselves. So, so the uh, one was to look at uh, citizenship at its founding moments, the constituent moment where the citizenship was seen as inclusive. So the Constituent Assembly discussed the ways in which you know, the returnees could be accommodated in doing citizenship. If you read this constitutional provisions of citizenship, the category of the migrant is uh, never a dis uh, is, is a category that is uh, articulated or, uh, uh, or placed in the constitutional uh, uh, text in a way where, where it uh, where it is where, where it allows for uh, 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 for citizenship. So, so migration in the con context of partition uh, was seen as a process through which citizenship uh, uh, could be uh, of a person could be decided. So people were migrating into citizenship. So there is a whole uh, 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 bureaucratic procedure post partition where you know, the, the enumeration of uh, the displaced persons, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the returnees, those who came on permits to, in, to India you know, within a certain uh, date that was identified uh, in the text, the constitutional text itself, were to be all accommodated into citizenship and their names included uh, in the, 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 the electoral roles so that they could become eligible to vote in the, uh, the first and the second election. So right up to 1956, if you were to look at the, uh, the archives of uh, uh, the citizenship uh, section of the archives of uh, the Home Department, you, know, you would find that the, the consultations among bureaucrats is you know, to think of modalities through which this displaced persons could be accommodated onto the electoral rolls and made complete citizens in, in some senses. So there is this, this a beginning of citizenship where citizenship is construed as you know, inclusive, as, 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 as a condition uh, which would accommodate you know, people. And, and, you know, and, and the bureaucratic concerns and the political concerns were largely around how to to make as as many people as possible citizens of the country so so the, we begin from an inclusive moment 1955 act takes this forward to to identify a whole range of conditions you no know, which would enable people to become citizens not only through the birth through through birth you no know, which would be you no know, uh uh, uh, being born in the territory of India. So everybody who was born in the territory of India would be considered a citizen by birth. There is the entire category of descent where you would be able to you know, uh, 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 take uh, forward or assume this of citizenship of your parents through blood. And then, of course, naturalization, registration, also acquisition of territory, etc. So there were these are the whole range of conditions that made it possible uh, to for you no know, people to retain people to uh, become Indian citizens. Uh, so the 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 idea of uh, citizenship as an encompassing momentum concept can be seen as sustaining itself. You know, Nineteen. 85, 86 is the other moment 
where you see a, the sustenance of the logic of encompassment uh, so that you know uh, the 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 citizenship law addresses itself to the specific context of assam and inscribes the assam exception into the citizenship law so so uh, the uh, to give expression to the commitment that the 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 central government had made to the assamese people so that you have an entire section added into the uh, uh to the uh, the to the citizenship law uh, to say that uh, you no know, uh, people who uh, who who uh, to to say that you know, there are you no know, people who entered assam from the an adjoining uh, territory you know uh, bangladesh and and came between uh, a certain specified dates you know, the, if they came before january 1966 their citizenship would not be disputed and they would be considered citizens of india those who came between uh, 1966 and 1971 uh, would be uh, uh, 24 march 1971 would be considered citizens of india when identified as such under the foreigners act but they would be disenfranchised for 10 years and uh, for all other purposes they would be citizens of india but without vote but you no know, after 4 years of their identification they, after 10 years of their identification their names would be brought back on the electoral rolls and they would become citizens of india and then there was this uh, uh, 2003 amendment you no know, which brought in the category of the overseas citizen of india which then maybe if one was to see it you know as a continuing logic of encompassment and citizenship as a momentum concept one would see the 2003 moment as a moment of encompassment because you no know, it reflected the uh, the realities of a changed world you know of uh, of the way in which uh, the the a uh, mobility of people and the flexibility that citizenship had as- assumed made citizenship deterritorialized so that a person who had citizenship of another country could continue to have their links with you know their f- the the countries of origin through the uh, through the overseas the provision of the of overseas citizenship of india so the th- 2003 moment was could also be in some senses construed as a moment of ex- of encompassment but this is one way of looking at this story you know the how do you connect the signposts and i would argue that this is perhaps uh, not the real story because the story can there is an analogous story that can also be told so if you were to go back and look at the 1955 act and see Now, what is it that the 1955 Act provided? No, it provided for different modalities of acquisition of citizenship, and there there was this modality of citizenship where no, which was associated uh, with the idea or the principle of jus soli, where no principle of birth associated with citizenship, where you who who, who people born on uh, uh, the territory of India, with a few exceptions, could become. citizens of india so so that was the 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 the, the point you no know, at which we started you know in 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 our im- imagination of citizenship now as we move forward you know if you look at the assam exception for example uh the assam assam exception was you know and ex- the in, in the citizenship law uh, uh the 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 inscription of assam exception brought in for the first time uh the the category of illegal migrants you no know, in the citizenship law and the category of illegal migrants was associated with the specific historical context of assam so that you no know, it said that post you no know, people who came after 24th march 1971 would be identified under the imd illegal migrants determination of uh, 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 uh illegal migrants uh determination by tribunals act 1983 uh which is which which is now repealed and you no know, once they were identified under the imdt act you know, the the people who are you no know, uh, 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 who identified as illegal migrants under the imdt act 
uh, would be uh, deported to Bangladesh. So, so, so within Assam, uh, the 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 amendment you know, created a graded uh, hierarchy of citizenship, so that there would be an undisputed category of uh, uh, citizens uh, who, and uh, there would be this other residual category uh, who would then also be divided you know, uh, on the basis of when they entered Assam. There would be some who, who would become citizens, but after 10 years of, uh, uh, of, of their identification as, uh, as, uh, as, as people who came from Bangladesh. And, uh, and identified as such under the Foreigners Act. But there would then be uh, a section of people who would be identified under the IMDT Act. They would be considered illegal migrants for deportation. And, and since both these regimes of law, the Foreigners Act as well as the, uh, the, uh, the, the IMDT Act, both these regimes were to operate simultaneously, there would be a... a, a, a no, a, su a suspicion around the citizenship of a large number of people who would be ethnically different, who spoke a different language, who were not Assamia speaking, Bengali speaking, etc. So what the what the uh, what the amendment actually did, you no, know, through the Assam exception, was to bring in another chronological boundary of citizenship, you know, into the Citizenship Act. So whereas for the rest of the country, the chronological boundary was different, you know, for Assam, it became 24th March, 1971. Alongside, you know, there, there was a change in the citizenship by birth provision. So whereas in 1955, everybody was born in India would be an Indian citizen. In the 1986 amendment, you know, a person who, would, who was born on the territory of India would be an Indian citizen only if one of her parents or his parents was also an Indian citizen. So we see now uh, uh, a movement towards you know, uh, 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 st uh, steering away from the principle of use soli and its qualification with the principle of use sanguinous. So the principle of birth citizenship was constrained and made conditional upon parentage, partially, but there was a decisive movement at this point in time. If we go to the 2003 moment, no, uh, the 2003 moment, which was the moment of deterritorialization of citizenship through the recognition of the category of the overseas citizen of India. But this was a deceptive uh, category in the sense that no, it did not allow for dual citizenship. No, it allowed only for the person who was the citizen of another country, but who was eligible or was to become a citizen of India at uh, in 1950, or you know, whose parents were citizens of India, to to acquire something like an overseas card, you no, know, which would you no know, make which would you no know, give this person certain privileges of uh, a lifelong visa, you no know, of uh, you no know, access to. Uh, certain kinds of property or certain kinds of employment, uh, but these were also constrained, you know, in the sense that you know, uh, uh, certain officers, political officers, were close to uh, to 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 the OCIs, etc. So, and and, and there there is you know, an element of uh, use sanguinis again associated with the OCI because. The OCI is a person of Indian origin. No, it's uh, it's not no, the OCI cannot be a person who has a, the citizenship of India and no, perhaps another country, the United States of America, for example, and 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 uh, and he can hold or she can hold passports of both the countries. So a person of Indian origin is the only person who can become an Indian, uh, an overseas citizen of India. Uh, simultaneously, and this is something that I would want to emphasize, and this is why I look at the 2003 moment as decisive in the life of citizenship law in India, is that it introduced the category of illegal migrant in the provision of citizenship by birth to say that a person born on the territory of India would be an Indian citizen only if both the parents were Indian citizens 
or one of the parents is an Indian citizen and the other is not an illegal migrant. So this category of the illegal migrant introduced in uh, the birth, the citizenship by birth provisions in the citizenship law becomes decisive, which we'll see later when the, the amendments to the Citizenship Act were introduced in 2016 and 2019. Now, a third uh, a change that I'd want to flag, which came in the 2003 moment again, and you know, again became uh, significant in, in, in the period 2015 onwards, was the provision that it was the responsibility of the state if it wanted that the, the Citizenship Act is very clear in this amendment. If you looked at Section 14A of the Citizenship Act, it says that the state may prepare a national register of Indian citizens and uh, you know, put in place the modalities that would be required to do so. So and issue national identity cards to citizens who are you know, identified as uh, to those who are identified as citizens, Indian citizens, you know, when the National Register of Indian Citizens is prepared. So the, 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 the 2003 moment becomes important, you know, A, for the, 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 the provision uh, that constrained citizenship by birth you know, and uh, you know, brought in the category of illegal migrants within the provision of birth, constrained citizenship birth entirely to make it, you know, uh, uh, make it uh, uh, to embed it in principle of use sanguinis, and the uh, the 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 uh, putting in place of uh, uh, provisions of uh, an NRC, and simultaneously, you know, if you were to to look at the rules that were framed uh, for making this provision effective. It, uh, no, it, it laid down the provision for the preparation of a national population register, which would be you know, one of the steps that needed to be taken in order for a national register of Indian citizens to be made. Uh, and, 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 and furthermore, an, as an exception again for Assam that was inserted in the rules so, so that you know, if there was an NRC for the entire country, uh, the NRC, the preparation of the NRC would take the form of a house to house uh, uh, enumeration of citizens uh, in particular, which would you know, not, uh, which would be implemented in particular local areas and then pan out to in the entire country. Uh, but it would involve officials coming to your homes and uh, enumerating uh, uh, you on on certain uh, premises that would be identified in, in, in the rules that would be subsequently made. Now, in the case of Assam, there was an exception. And this exception was not only in, in terms of uh, who would be uh, uh, considered uh, an Indian citizen residing in Assam, uh, but what would be the modalities of preparation of this NR, uh, NRC? And uh, no, what we see in the case of Assam, the modalities of preparation uh, introduced in an exception where you know, the, the, those who wanted to be included in the NRC they, in Assam they had to apply to do so. And, and, and while making this application, they had to give certain kinds of proof, you know, so which would mean that uh, there were there were innovations in the in the context of Assam where something called a legacy data was uh, you know, uh, brought into uh, 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 as, uh, as as legacy data uh, was uh, you know, innovated you know, and, and legacy data would 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 constitute of the NRC 1951 uh, which was you no know, uh, prepared only for Assam. And, uh, and 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 the electoral rolls right up to tw the midnight of 24th March 1971, and these together would constitute the legacy data. So whoever is applying uh, for the their registration on the NRC uh, would have to give proof of uh, you no know, their names being on the legacy data. So they need to show that they are on the NRC 1951 
or any of the electoral rolls right up to 24th March 1971. And if their names are not there, they needed to, from a list of documents that had been specified, show give linkage documents where they needed to, uh, to, to, to provide evidence through specified documents, their connection with people who were on the legacy documents. So, so there is, through this entire exercise of NRC, another, uh, maybe a, a conceptual interruption was brought into the way we think about citizenship, where a hyphenated citizenship, notion of citizenship was brought into existence, where a person would be primarily to, uh, to prove that he or she was an Indian citizen, he or she had to first prove that she or he was legibly an Assamese citizen and had to provide evidence through documents that uh, you know, that the state required. And it's in an interesting formulation, if you were to read this book, Paper Citizens by Kamal Sadek, he, he talks about uh, the, the, the idea that uh, states work with when they enumerate uh, and identify citizens, that there is you know, something called a distinguish distinguishability assumption, which means that the states would be able to make the distinction between citizens and non-citizens on the basis of documents. And in certain ways, it inverted the way in which the association of documents was seen with citizenship. So in, in, in when, when one thinks about citizenship, and one thinks about documents that one possesses, those, most of these documents are in our possession or we acquire those documents because we are citizens. So, so a voter ID card is, you know, is, 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 is available to us because we are citizens of the country and the, the card enables us to perform an important responsibility of voting in an election, so but the 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 voting the, the voter ID card assumed a different uh, character and identity under the you no know, uh, under the uh, the modalities of preparation of NRC in Assam. A voter ID card would not automatically be evidence of citizenship or proof of citizenship unless it provided also the link with the legacy documents. So so who was the legacy person that you could you know, prove, give evidence of your connection with. And, uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, a certain a bounded notion of citizenship uh, has come into existence with the idea of citizenship, where you no know, citizenship can actually accommodate migrants if they have proof of citizenship. Uh, but you no, know, it is bounded by the consideration that uh, now there is certain a, a boundary condition now that uh, that reinforces you know, those who would belong and those who would not belong and you no know, we would perhaps share everything but first of all we'll share it among ourselves so the idea of boundary conditions and bounded citizenship etc you know, has has come into existence with the idea of the NRC and therefore I would say that again we see a movement towards closures of citizenship through the 2003 amendment, which you know, there was there was the 1986 moment put that place in, in place for the first time. So through the uh, constraints on citizenship by board, through a graded uh, uh, idea of citizenship uh, for Assam, the 2003 moment was decisive. You no, know, it ensured that a bounded notion of citizenship was put in place. And, and this took in the place in the context of an NDA regime, you know, which came, which had uh, uh, an explicit agenda or, or explicit idea or imaginary of what Indian citizenship ought to look like. Now, if we move on from 2003 to 2016, and I would end my lecture with that discussion, uh, the 2016, uh, the CAB, you know, which, with certain changes was passed uh, in 2019 as CAA 2019, made exceptions to the illegal migrants provision that had been put in place in the citizenship by birth provisions in 2003 to say that certain categories of people would be exempted from that. You know, uh, the, 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 uh, the constraints that uh, illegal migrants uh, put in place. And, and these exempted categories 
would be identified on the basis of religion. So this was another uh, innovation in, in uh, the way in which citizenship had been thought of. And another, uh, 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 another imagination of citizenship was put in place through a legal amendment where you no know, distinctions among citizens could be made, distinction among citizens could be made on the basis of their religious identification. So, so the 2016-2019 amendment allowed for uh, people who were you know, belonged to um, six religions, so, so and uh, you know, Hindu, Buddhist, Christians, uh, Parsis, and uh, and Sikhs, and uh, 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 and belonged to three countries, you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and had suffered religious persecution uh, and had entered India before 31st December 2014 to be exempted from the constraints that, you know, that the, the provision of illegal migrants had put in place to remove the, the punitive controls that the state would have on, on, on them, the punishments and the liabilities that they would have because they were illegal migrants, and also make them uh, 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 make them uh, eligible to apply for citizenship by uh, uh, registration, and 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 of course there were there, there was a whole range of uh, uh, dispute that emerged around the 2016 amendment and 2019 amendment. And uh, whereas I'm, I'm not going to go into those disputes, but there are perhaps a couple of things that uh, no, I would want to say in, 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 in terms of the questions around the, the, the methodology of looking at uh, citizenship law that I raised at the beginning of uh, this section is to, to, to see you know, uh, how we look at this particular moment. You know? so one is to, to see this moment as uh, of, of 2019 as one that decisively puts in place an idea of national citizenship and national citizenship identified on the basis again of uh, you know, a boundary condition and an identification of citizenship with an imagination of a homeland you know, where you no know, people who've been persecuted because of their religion could return and this idea of return again uh, installs an idea of, of India as a homeland of some people. So, so there is an ethno-cultural idea of belonging that has been put in place. Uh, of course, there is a, a liberal objective that is given to it. You know, people who have been persecuted on the basis of religion deserve protection. They, they need to be protected. Uh, but whether this would be the way in which the protection, protection ought to be given is something that has been disputed in, 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 in various uh, fora and in, in various academic interventions as well as in affidavits that have been made in, before the Supreme Court you know, uh, uh, through much of uh, 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 December. Uh, 2020 to March 20, uh, 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 20, uh, uh, December 9, 20, 2019 to March 2020, excuse me. So though that, that was a period you know, uh, 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 within which a lot of uh, affidavits and petitions were made before the Supreme Court to contest the, 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 the narrow, uh, the, the, the protection that was being afforded to persecuted people and it was argued that this was a narrow perspective in the sense that if protection of citizenship was to be offered, why not make the protection expansive to not limit it to particular religious communities. So make it expansive in order to uh, include a whole range of other persecuted communities. And it is interesting that when the Joint Parliamentary Committee that looked into the citizenship, the citizenship Amendment Bill of 2016 and made its recommendations uh, through the, 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 the depositions and uh, witness accounts that it had gathered uh, through various field works you know, in, in, the, in, the, in states in the Northeast, in Rajasthan and Gujarat, and also experts belonging to uh, different fields, you know, including 
uh, uh, constitutional law. And uh, the JPC was offered a suggestion which said that instead of religious minorities, why don't you use the category of persecuted minorities to, to, to uh, you know, kind of forestall a charge that would, was, would be made that the, the, the act violates the uh, provisions of the constitution, particularly Article 14 of the constitution, which is uh, you know, which, which uh, gives the protection or to all persons you know, before and, and of equality before the law and equal protection of the law. And, and it's interesting again that the JPC uh, addressed that uh, suggestion by saying that they needed to uh, retain the focus on a religious uh, persecution. So they didn't want to lose the focus on religious persecution. And uh, there were other uh, uh, standard operating procedures that were available to uh, for other forms of persecution that other communities may suffer. But this, the focus on these specific communities and those particular countries needed to be retained. And in order to address that challenge, they said that, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you look at Article 14 and the jurisprudence that had, has accumulated around Article 14, uh, uh, and, and, and if you look at the citizenship law, uh, they said that uh, the law is fine. You know, it, 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 can, it would stand the charge of, uh, uh, if it were to be made of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, being uh, against the constitution, because what it does is that it identifies a specific class of persons uh, for protection. And therefore, in the legal language, uh, there is an intelligible differentia that can be made. So there is a class of persons that can be seen as you no, know, as 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 uh, uh, as as different from other classes of persons. And the the fact of religious persecution binds them together and gives them an identity. So there is an intelligible differentia that exists. And and this differentia in making that differentia the state is reasonable. So this classification is reasonable on the ground that there is a specific objective of the act. And that objective is protection of religious minorities from persecution and offering the protection of citizenship in order to uh, ensure that there is the, 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 they do not suffer religious persecution. And, uh, and, and, and therefore, that objective is served through that differentiation, and therefore that differentiation is also reasonable. There have been challenges to this position to say that it's not just intelligibility of the uh, classification as, and its reasonableness, which is important, but it's also important to see whether the objectives themselves are reasonable. No? So the objective of the act can also be subject to scrutiny. And uh, the questions of arbitrariness around them, around the objective, can also be raised. And therefore, the challenge of Article 14 would still remain. And, 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 and there is a way in which other judgments, like the NAS Foundation judgment, have been invoked to say that there's, there's, a, there's, a, 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 there's something called critical morality that, you know, that, uh, that becomes important uh, when one looks at uh, the questions of law and how they need to be uh, adjudicated in, in, in the spaces of the court. And uh, this critical morality is something that draws from the Constitution of India. And critical morality is expected to displace any kind of uh, you know, public morality that, you know, the, that uh, a law may want to uh, uh, embody. And, and this critical morality is important because at the end of the day, what is important is the, 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 the form of the, the substance of the constitution and how the substance of the constitution is sustained. And, and the form of the government needs to correspond to the, cons the form that the constitution puts in place. And, and, and there needs to be a protection which constitutional morality offers where the uh, it, it needs to be ensured that uh, the constitution is not perverted 
you know, through making changes in the form of government, you know, which uh, with uh, and, and 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 not maybe visibly changing the constitution itself. So, uh, but uh, Ambedkar would say that there is a correspondence. The chart, the constitution can be perverted without changing the constitution itself by only changing the form of government. So the the debate around in the 2016-2019 moment focuses on how the imagination of citizenship that existed in the form of an inclusionary citizenship, the idea of a nation that was not a, a, a totality of persons who expressed their identities as Indian citizens, but this identity was not allied to a religious identity. So that this, this one big contention that continues to be uh, uh, in place. So I end by saying that, uh, and I, I end by saying that uh, no, there is a way in which uh, the idea of citizenship and uh, how, how we look at the contemporary moment of citizenship through the lenses of both status and uh, lenses of an ideal and, and, and promise remain important. And so do the methodological frameworks of how we look at citizenship through the, the idea of uh, you know, law itself having a life. We saw how law moved from specific signposts and through these movements uh, and through this movement along these signposts, not just law changed its form, but the imagination of citizenship also changed its forms. And, and while it moved, citizenship was also performing certain functions of uh, you know, identifying you know, who would be uh, citizens of India and you know, what would uh, categories such as illegal migrant mean and what kind of uh, 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 demarcations of citizenship uh, the law was able to put in place. And therefore, the, again, the, 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 the statement with which I began with, you know, how, how does the state enable uh, its reproduction and reinforcement through the modalities and instrumentalities of citizenship? Thank you so much.